the General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon. And by any definition, it's a most remarkable aircraft. When it first went into service in 1979, it was a representation of the latest technology available to military aviation anywhere. But whilst the technology that powers and guides this brilliant warplane was the high point of years of progressive technological evolution, the role which it was designed to perform is, if anything, a step back against the evolution of the task of the fighter plane. In fact, the pilot that flies this F-16 has less in common with most of his modern-day counterparts than he does with this man. Because both fly aircraft that excel in a dogfighting combat between two fighter aircraft, yet both planes are capable of a ground attack role. When America entered the Second World War, it encountered Axis planes like the German Focke-Wulf 190 and the Japanese Zero. Light and extremely agile, they proved difficult to deal with. But the high point of the American counter to the Axis dogfighters was undoubtedly the P-51 Mustang, originally conceived to fill a British requirement. The P-51 evolved into a long-range, heavily armed, high-performance fighter that could meet the challenge in both the European and Pacific theaters. Later versions with their bubble canopy providing excellent vision ruled the air over Japan and whilst never quite as agile as the far lighter Zero, the Mustang's combination of speed, firepower and sufficient agility in the hands of the American stick and rudder man was conclusive. But long before the war was over, America, like other nations in the conflict, was experimenting with jet power. However, the output of early engines was low, and at least two power plants were required if any reasonable performance was to be achieved. It was only after the war that the jet was developed to the stage where one engine would provide the thrust to power a fighter at high speed. But if jet engine development had radically progressed, little had evolved to the shape of the aircraft they were to power. Like this Republic F-84 Thunderjet, a very useful aircraft, but with the same straight wings and tailplane that might have been used in World War II. The North American Aviation Company, which also designed the Mustang, did on the other hand offer a new silhouette. They had studied information captured from the Germans at the end of the war and deduced that a swept-back swing surface would provide an aircraft with extra speed and still give good stability. Problems were incurred at low speed, 
But when these were tackled successfully, the F-86 proved to be an excellent aircraft with high-speed maneuverability and firepower. It provided a worthy successor to the P-51, and this development most timely. For America did not have a monopoly on the swept wing. Russia had, like the US, produced straight-wing jets early after the war. But like the US, they had also gained data from captured German designs, which they quickly used in the early swept-wing fighters. The most infamous of these was the MiG-15, which shocked the West out of its complacency when it first appeared over Korea in 1950. The 10 to 1 kill ratio that American aviators claimed over MiGs during Korean dogfights was also very much due to the skill of its pilots. This combination of man and machine had saved the day, but time for the dogfighter was about to run out. During the early 50s and the Cold War, America considered the role of its fighter aircraft to be that of destroying long-range Russian bombers which threatened nuclear attack. The best weapon against such aircraft would not be the machine guns of aircraft like the Sabre, but rockets which at first were fired in salvos in the hope that at least one might hit and bring down any predatory bomber. Rockets were developed for air-to-air -air and air-to-ground use. And as their sophistication improved, the role of the fighter plane was reduced to that of a missile platform from which rockets could be launched. The fighter aircraft was to be made faster and to go higher, but agility was no longer a concern. By the middle 60s, the US was committing air power to the Southeast Asian conflict. And whilst its fighter bombers were effective in the ground attack role, they were not dogfighters. When North Vietnamese MiGs appeared, the faster and more sophisticated American fighter bombers just were not agile enough to bring down MiGs, which were only a slight improvement over those used 15 years earlier in Korea. Another complicating factor was that the rules of engagement over Vietnam required US pilots to see and closely identify their targets before weapon release. This meant that the tactics of long-range missile attacks against Russian bombers previously developed were useless. The Air Force's answer, or as much of one as there was to be, came from the United States Navy. Whilst they too had been developing high-speed missile platforms, along the line had evolved a truly versatile aircraft in the shape of the McDonnell F-4 Phantom, sometimes referred to as the St. Louis Slogger due to its city of origin and enormous lifting power.
This aircraft was never a true dogfighter, but its very high speed, together with a degree of maneuverability, was in some ways an answer to the MiG problem. By the late 60s, both the US Navy and the Air Force had begun separate programs to fill the vacuum created by the lack of a highly agile dogfighter. The Navy adopted a sophisticated but expensive approach in developing an aircraft that could successfully perform two different types of missions. The Grumman F-14 Tomcat still retained a crew of two, but had variable swept wings which could be adjusted to suit the type of mission it was required to perform. With the wings swept back in a delta configuration, it was able to reach very high speeds and climb rapidly. With the wings set forward, it could achieve greater agility and despite its considerable size, outmaneuvered much smaller aircraft. Yet despite its other performance capabilities, it could still fulfill its most fundamental role, that of fleet defense fighter. An aircraft that could launch long-range, highly accurate guided missiles towards an aerial threat against the fleet it was charged with protecting. The Air Force, having a less diverse mission requirement, looked towards the fixed wing design offered by McDonnell Douglas in the F-15 Eagle. This single-seat, high-performance fighter is without doubt the best dedicated dogfighter in service anywhere. But its cost prohibits its use in the sort of numbers that Eastern Bloc countries were known to be employing. Clearly, a need existed for an economical, high-performance fighter that could be built in sufficient numbers to compete with the Soviet threat. And on the 6th of January, 1972, the US Defense Department sought submissions from the aviation industry to fill such a role. After submissions from nine companies, the list was reduced to the designs offered by Northrop and General Dynamics. The design presented by Northrop, working in collaboration with McDonnell Douglas, was for a twin-engined lightweight fighter employing two separate tail fins giving it an appearance not unlike the F-15, but somewhat smaller in size. The design was given the Air Force prefix YF-17, and an order for two prototypes was placed. The General Dynamics concept employed a single-engine design of the same type used in the twin-engine F-15 Eagle, thus offering the Air Force commonality of spare parts. But as many late Western designs had chosen to offer two power plants, as a safeguard against engine failure, GD were waging an awful lot on the excellent reputation of the Pratt & Whitney F100 engine. Nevertheless, an order for two prototypes, now designated YF-16, was placed. Completed in January 74, the first YF-16 was transported to Edwards Air Force Base, where on the 2nd of February, it commenced its first official flight and a series of extensive tests in preparation for comparison with its competitor, the YF-17. The Northrop plane was completed in June 74, 
and after testing was flown alongside General Dynamics aircraft in a fly-off, which formed part of the decision-making process to resolve which concept would win what was now known as the Air Combat Fighter Competition. In the event, it was the overall performance of the F-16 prototypes that impressed the Defence Department the most. On the 9th of April, 1975, a pre-production order of 15 aircraft was placed, with the prospect of 650 aircraft to be purchased over five years. But it can never be said that the Northrop design was anything other than excellent. And after it was declined, McDonnell Douglas, the co-designers, continued its development until it evolved into the F-18 Hornet, now in service with the US Navy. Another development, which both manufacturers were aware of, was that aging F-104 Starfighters, which equipped several European NATO air forces, would soon need to be replaced. And a substantial sale from this area as well would be the fighter deal of the century. An ideal opportunity to display the F-16's ability to European clients came with the Paris Air Show in May 1975. At the hands of GD's chief test pilot, Neil Anderson, the red, white and blue lightweight fighter thrilled the crowd and impressed the experts, many of whom had been studying the design for some time looking for a replacement European fighter. A plane which would offer economy but would not sacrifice performance as whichever aircraft was chosen would have to stand in the face of the immense Warsaw Pact aerial might. Despite the airshow performance, it's probable that four NATO air forces had already made up their minds about the F-16's suitability for Europe. And less than a month afterwards, a combined order for 306 aircraft was placed on a joint production basis, providing work for scores of manufacturers on both sides of the Atlantic. With substantial orders on hand, GD's Fort Worth plant went into top gear. And in December 1976, the first F-16A model, a single seat version, was rolled out. For General Dynamics, it was the justification of all its technology, research and investment. The multinational fighter concept was now well underway. But the secret of the success of the F-16 is the sum of many different advanced high-tech features several of them used for the first time in any combat aircraft, and some tried and well tested like the F-100 engine. General Dynamics' confidence in a single engine, but of excellent design, had paid off. New and untried previously was a provision made to reduce the stress forces on pilots as their F-16s maneuvered. The pilot's seat was laid back at an angle of 30 degrees in a similar position to this demonstrator. The effect is not only to reduce stress and fatigue, but it has often been said that it leaves pilots with the feeling that they are actually part of their aircraft. The cockpit layout was designed so that every piece of information is readily available.
and the heads-up display projects vital information onto the HUD weapon sight glass directly in front of the pilot. So in action, his eyes need never look down into the cockpit. And all of the hand controls are placed for almost fingertip control. The F-16 also employs advanced radar for search weapons control and guidance. One of its most subtle yet beneficial features is the one-piece canopy. General Dynamics recognized, as with the Mustang and Sabre, the maximum visibility could provide just that small edge that today's dogfighters might still need over their opponents. The four-body strain and the blending of the wing to the main fuselage, another major advance, provides added lift and greater lateral control. The phenomenal maneuverability and agility that allows the F-16 pilot to outperform all other aircraft is a result of the blending of two new sciences, fly-by-wire electrical operation of the aircraft's control surface actuators and a relaxed stability center of gravity arrangement. When both of these innovations work in concert with the F-16's electronics and automatic flight control, the result leaves the aircraft in a class of its own. High turnaround speed is essential for any modern day fighter. Its ability to land, refuel and have minor repairs and rearm is fundamental to its effectiveness in combat. And GD's lightweight was designed with all this in mind. And mindful of the dogfight mission, it was equipped with an M61 cannon as well as missilery and an almost staggering array of potential weapon loads. One thing the multinational fighter concept did mean was that the aviation industries of the four participating European nations would enjoy much of the benefit of the F-16's success through subcontracting, licensing and ultimate assembly. Even to the extent that 10% of the components of all US Air Force planes were to be produced in European factories. Factories that would also enjoy the benefit of further sales to other nations. But the first and major assembly line was to be General Dynamics plant at Fort Worth in Texas. So large was the program, the planning of assembly could only be effectively achieved with scale models, which serve here to give some indication of the complexity of the task.
As production and assembly got underway at Fort Worth, manufacture of components allocated for European construction also got underway. By August 1978, the first full production F-16 was rolling off the Fort Worth line and undergoing pre-acceptance trials. By January 1979, the United States Air Force took delivery of its first F-16, by now called the Fighting Falcon. Within weeks, other NATO Air Forces were receiving their own planes.
Interest for the F-16 had been coming from other countries, including Iran, who ordered 160 in 1979. But due to the change in power in that country, the order was cancelled by the United States. Eventually, some of that order, 79 aircraft, found their way to the Israeli Air Force, another Mediterranean nation to place early orders for the Fighting Falcon. By now, the F-16 was almost becoming the standard fighter for Western countries who did not produce their own aircraft. And in every case, apart from the one or two seat option, all Fighting Falcons were outwardly the same. There were, however, two exceptions, which although never went into production, did valuable research work and demonstrated yet again how versatile the F-16 actually is. Following on from other tests, the Advanced Fighter Technology Integration, or AFTI modification, to a standard F-16 can be seen protruding from the lower portion of the jet intake of this aircraft, like two large fins almost touching the runway. These fins are movable in the same way as the tailplane, and when operated via a computer, and in conjunction with other flight control surfaces, the aircraft can virtually be moved directly sideways, providing another type of agility for this already agile fighter. But the concept was purely experimental and is not likely to go into production, although the information gained will almost certainly be useful in later generations of fighter aircraft. Another modification was the F-16XL, or SCAM. This design features a cranked arrow delta wing, instead of the conventional wing and tailplane layout. The concept would allow greater carrying capacity and range, but most novel of all, although the idea is only experimental, if it was adopted, it could be possible to upgrade standard F-16s as the basic fuselage remains unaltered. Hill Air Force Base, Utah, home of the 388th Tactical Fighter Wing. The first to use fighting Falcons. At exercise time, it's a very busy place. As combat aircrew gained familiarity with the new aircraft, they fast became aware that this superb fighter reflected the same level of excellence in its ground attack role.
So it was perhaps not surprising when it was chosen to represent TAC at the 1981 tactical bombing competition at Lossiemouth in Scotland. The competition was to focus on the ground attack capabilities of two types of aircraft provided from the British and two from the US. The British state-of-the-art ground attack aircraft at the time was the BAC Jaguar, seen here receiving moral support from the British service personnel. The F-111 swing-wing tactical bomber, which came from the same stable as the F-16 and saw service in Vietnam, would also be a contender. As with the British twin-engine Buccaneer, a veteran of many years of useful service as a naval attack bomber, but now employed by the Royal Air Force, all three planes had proven performance records. But the unknown ingredient was the newcomer. The F-16, a fighter aircraft, was to win the accuracy competition even against the dedicated ground attack Jaguar. But the competition is not just one of bombing accuracy. It involves all aspects of combat readiness and effectiveness. Navigation, aircraft turnaround, pilot skills and tactics. In all aspects, the F-16 team was to acquit itself with breathtaking effectiveness. By the time the final results were calculated, General Dynamics' brilliant lightweight was to earn the number one position in the final formation. However, the success of the F-16 at Lossimo should not have come as a complete surprise, because not ten days earlier, its bombing potential had been demonstrated to the world when, with devastating accuracy, Israeli Air Force F-16s destroyed the Iraqi nuclear power plant at Ozarek, near Baghdad. The mission objective was for Israeli aircraft based in the Sinai to fly 650 miles across enemy country and destroy the nuclear plant, 
only days before it became operational, depriving the Iraqis of the ability to produce atomic weapons. The most direct route would ordinarily have been the obvious choice, but Israel is a nation surrounded by its enemies, and Arab radar stations, especially near the Jordanian border, would detect aircraft approaching from the west. Taking a long curved route further to the south may have been possible, but for the fact that American AWAC aircraft based in Saudi Arabia might possibly have detected unexpected aerial activity, even over such long distances. So because of the high mobility and effectiveness of the AWACS, this plan too was rejected. A third but extremely risky option was to actually try to weave a course between the Arab radar stations. To make this plan work, Israeli pilots practice flying at very low levels over long distances. They also studied plans of the power plant and its various features, but most of all the position of the reactor building which housed the nuclear core. Ever since the raid took place, a question has remained about the type of weapon that the IAF used. Because when they did strike, it was with such accuracy that some observers believed they used laser-guided bombs, similar to this type developed by the United States. You can see here from this test how the bomb constantly adjusts itself in flight until it finds its target. Israel is thought to have developed its own guided bombs, but it still insists to this day it only used conventional 2,000 pound iron bombs and that the incredible precision is due to the F-16 and the constant training of their pilots. Late in the afternoon of the raid, six Israeli F-15 Eagles, acting as fighter escort for eight F-16s chosen for the raid, took to the air over Sinai. Flying low, they skirted the southern tip of Jordan, keeping total radio silence and relying entirely upon their training and sheer courage as they flew at hilltop altitude. It has been suggested that at one point the mission was actually challenged by Arab ground control and that by speaking in Arabic, an Israeli pilot convinced the radar operator that this was actually a Jordanian training flight. Another report suggests that at one stage, some of the Israelis climbed and grouped their planes so tightly that on ground radar they looked like one civil airliner. It is also thought that at least one F-16 was a two-seat B model, which carried a cameraman to record the attack. After 80 minutes in the air, the force approached its target and prepared to strike. The F-15s peeled off to give fighter cover, should it be needed, and the F-16s climbed before diving to attack. The first plane's bombs found their mark, and the others followed. And in less than two minutes, Israeli pilots were to see the complete destruction of their target before taking the direct course back to their base. But if the Baghdad raid was to prove the F-16 a bomber in combat, a year later, when Syria threatened Israeli air power with surface-to-air missiles, supported by late model MiGs, Israeli F-16s were to demonstrate their fighter ability over the Becker Valley. Together with IAF Eagles and F-4s, they devastated Syrian fighters in classic dogfight situations. One-on-one, -on -one, Syrian MiGs were simply no match for Israeli F-16s.
Whether with the IAF in the Middle East, or with the US Air Force flying from bases at home or abroad, or in the hands of other NATO pilots, the Fighting Falcon has proved itself in vigorous exercise and in actual combat to be probably the greatest single advance in combat fighters since the arrival of the jet. This gun camera footage symbolizes all that the Fighting Falcon really stands for, an aircraft reverting back to the best traditions of the Mustang and the Sabre. But at the same time, the F-16 pilot is reminded of the awesome leaps in technology and that which he has at his disposal by the heads-up display constantly feeding him upgraded information, all to assist in the same basic aim the US sought in World War II and Korea. Air superiority over the enemy. 